Okay. Well, with that, it seems like the largest flow of attendees has slowed. So I'd like to begin by welcoming everybody to one of the 2022 uh, Edgar and Dorothy Davidson lectures, and I'd like to begin by acknowledging that the land upon which we virtually gather is the traditional and unceded territory of the Algonquin Nation. So in tonight's event, uh, we're going to begin with the uh, director of the College of Humanities making some brief introductory remarks. It'll come back to me to introduce our honored speaker, and then we'll begin the event proper. So with that said, I transfer you over to the capable hands of Shauna Delansky. Thank you, Chris. Uh, and good evening, everybody, and welcome to the final event in our Religion and Public Life series for this academic year. Um, I am the acting director of the College of the Humanities. I'm also a faculty member in the religion program, and it has been my pleasure to be involved in this series and its programming for the past couple of years that we've been doing it. Uh, I want to thank Edgar and uh, the, the Edgar and Dorothy Davidson Fund, which generously allows us to offer these programs to the public. And I want to thank my colleagues, especially Chris, uh, who have participated in these and helped to organize them. Um, big thank you to the amazing communications team at the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences office, without whom none of these would be possible. Uh, Swapi, who has set up our webinars and registrations. Also, Alyssa, Kimberly, and Nick, thank you all so very much for all of your help and support this year. We started the Religion and Public Life Lecture Series last winter because, well, for one thing, we discovered Zoom. Uh, and the possibility of reaching larger and more diverse audiences, as well as a fantastic array of top scholars around the world who have been willing to present topical and engaging lectures for us without having to travel to Ottawa in the winter. The lecture series has been extremely successful and it has helped us to really demonstrate for a larger public exactly what religion and public life is all about. Uh, religion and public life is the stated focus of our small cohort, very dynamic Master of Arts program here in the College of the Humanities at Carleton. It's a 12 month program that combines coursework in both the theoretical and methodological study of religion, and also in hands on engagement with religious texts, ideas, communities, past and present, with a focus on the myriad ways in which the phenomena that we label religion or religious intersect with public life and with lived experience in social and political communities. So this is a very wide net. And we've had a ton of fantastic major research essays produced by our alumni on topics as wide ranging as ancient synagogue architecture, Jewish athletes and constructions of masculinity, atheist apologist online debates, Inuit women's conversions to Christianity, troubadours in the Middle Ages, uh, the choices of Muslim women in Canada to wear a hijab, graphic no novelization of the Bible. I mean, we've had a huge array of really, really interesting topics. Um, most recently, a panel of faculty colleagues addressed the religious ideologies and rhetorics surrounding the downtown convoy protests here in Ottawa from a variety of thoughtful and very interesting angles that really shed some light on and deepened discussions around the protests in the media. Um, we recorded that panel discussion. It will be up on our website for your viewing pleasure and I'll put the, um, the link in the chat where you'll find it. Uh, it should be up early next week. Uh, one last plug for the program. Although technically the deadline has passed, we have been known to accept applications to our master's program and we've also tried to fund students who have applied after the deadline well into the summer months. So do be in touch if you are at all interested in exploring a graduate program with us. Tonight's lecture will once again demonstrate the many ways in which religion and public life can intersect. And I'm going to turn it back over to Chris to introduce our speaker. Thanks very much. All right. Oh. All right. Thank you, Shauna. So the uh, Edgar and Dorothy Davidson lecture was established in 1983. Uh, and it's sponsored by the College of Humanities. And its goal is to allow Carleton students and faculty to benefit from the insights of a prominent scholar in religious studies and related fields. So with that said, it is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Brooke Shednick to Carleton to deliver one of this year's two Edgar and Dorothy Davidson lectures. 
Uh, Dr. Shednick is a distinguished Buddhist studies scholar who currently teaches at Rhodes College following an appointment at the Institute of South Asian Affairs in Chiang Mai, Thailand. Her eight years of residence and ethnographic research in Thailand have provided her with a wealth of insights into Buddhism as a situated living religion. She's uh, co-edited a volume on Buddhist tourism in Asia, Asia and her second volume, uh, Religious Tourism in Northern Thailand, Encounters with Buddhist Monks, was published last year by University of Washington Press. Uh, I first met Brooke at an uh, invitational conference entitled uh, Bodies of Buddhism back in February of 2020. So in other words, right before everything, you know, fell apart. Um, <laughs> there, she presented an initial paper on gender and embodiment among Thai monastics, which, in my humble opinion, was one of the highlights of the conference. And I immediately thought that she would be a perfect fit as a Davidson lecturer, given the extent to which this research intersected with the various research interests of faculty members in our religion and public life program. So even though it's been a few years in the making, I am pleased to finally be able to welcome Brooke to Carleton as a 2022 Davidson lecturer. Um, now, one final programmatic thing, uh, I'm going to be staying on as the moderator. So if you have any questions that come up during the lecture, please type them into the Q&A forum. And uh, I will, during the Q&A portion, following Brooke's prepared remarks, I'll be moderating those questions, synthesizing them together as necessary, and uh, just sort of helping the Q&A portion to go as smoothly as possible. Um, and it's helpful to me if you type in those questions as soon as you have them. Don't wait until the end and I'll type them at once because that's crazy making. So <laughs> with all of that being said, uh, thank you all for your time and attention. Thank you for being here. This is a great turnout and I am uh, so pleased to be able to turn you over to Dr. Brooke Shetnick. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chris, for that a lovely introduction. And thank you to Carleton University and the uh, Program on Religion and Public Life for hosting me. I'm very happy to share my research here. And I'm going to be giving a kind of tour of uh, Buddhism and contemporary Thailand that has to do with monasticism and monastic lay relations. And there's a lot of different strands that I'm going to go through that I think will, will all be, you know, interest, hopefully interesting and come together. Um, as you can see from the title already, <laughs> there are some multiple strands here. Um, and so the title, Who is a Good Monk? Everyday Scandals, Gender Policing, and the Lay Buddhist Gate in Contemporary Thailand. So I'm going to begin uh, unraveling some of these uh, threads and we'll understand all these terms by the end. But I'm going to begin with some images to get us into the topic. So the first image is a Thai Buddhist monk who goes shopping at the mall, trying on shoes and sampling the latest Apple products. The pictures he posts on Facebook are picked up by Thai media and stir much online discussion. The second image is a little blurry, but it's a screen, it's like a shot still taken from a video. And this is of a Buddhist monk dancing. I think you can see it in kind of, it's supposed to be that he's dancing in a kind of a feminine sexual way. You can see a little bit from his hand position there at his temple. And the video is shown on all the morning TV shows and debated on the TV shows there. So upon viewing images like the one just described, Thai lay Buddhists debate and consider what can a monk do with his body in public spaces? What are the appropriate actions for a monk inside the temple? These instances and questions point to one important issue. Thai Buddhists have much at stake in the monastic body. These images of minor transgressions I just showed, like shopping at the mall and dancing in a feminine way, already give a sense of the importance of monastic behavior in Thailand but they're also connected to more major scandals that involve criminal activity. So I'll give just some examples of those. In 2013, most Thai people uh, still know now, but definitely at that time, uh, most Thai people knew the name of the monk uh, pictured here, Luang Puneng Kam, and then he is now uh, disrobed, as you can see in his white t-shirt, um, his name now, Virapon Sukpon, his lay name. 
Before his forced exit from the monastic life, his nickname was the Jet Set Monk to the international media. This was because of a YouTube clip of the now infamous monk showing him riding in a private jet. Like you can see here, the Louis Vuitton bag is on the seat next to him. He has designer sunglasses. He has uh, a briefcase and he's counting the, the cash uh, that he's coming out of that briefcase. So after extradition, back to Thailand after he flew to America, he was finally sentenced in 2018 to 114 years in jail for deceiving 29 people into donating to bogus Buddhism and disaster relief projects and using the money to buy the jet and other luxury cars. In the late 1990s and again in 2017 uh, for the second major scandal we have here is Pradhamachayo, abbot of the controversial temple Wat Damakai. He and his temple filled the news with allegations of financial scandals and unorthodox teachings. After an extensive and well-publicized search of Wat Damakai for this abbot, Pradhamachayo, in 2017, the police failed to locate him and he has still never been found. And the third example is one of the more recent large-scale monastic news stories from May 2018, when four senior monks were arrested for alleged temple fund embezzlement worth more than millions of baht, which is hundreds of thousands of US dollars, in four Bangkok temples. These recent examples of corruption and suspicions of financial embezzlement are not simply isolated instances. There have been multiple cases of male monks implicating criminal activity. <clears throat> this has led to concern that Thai Buddhism is in a state of decline and crisis by Thai Buddhists. So these major scandals that I just discussed, uh, some examples of, have been part of Thai Buddhism for several decades now. So this is nothing new. And what I want to focus on is not the major monastic scandals that involve criminal activity, but the minor everyday scandals of misbehaving monks, which appear regularly in Thai media outlets. These everyday scandals include pictures of monks on motorcycles or shopping at the mall, mostly acting like regular non-monastic people. But also another aspect of this that I want to focus on is the transgressions of gender performance. So this transgression of gender performance can be seen in public discourse concerning effeminate or gatai monks. Gatai, as you can see the, the transliteration there, is a term for effeminate in Thai, a term for effeminate males or the performance of femininity in a male body. Monks who display this behavior are labeled gatai. Images of their feminine behavior are captured and circulated in Thai social media revealing the extent of surveillance surrounding male monastic bodily performance. I label this regulation by Thai Buddhist lay onto male monastics as the Thai Buddhist lay gaze. The prominence of social media and smart devices has allowed for not only journalists, but also regular Thai citizens to catch Buddhist monks displaying less than ideal behaviors. So this presentation will develop further the importance of these ideas of everyday scandals and the Thai Buddhist lay gaze for understanding Thai Buddhism and the boundaries of acceptability for the monastic body in contemporary Thailand. So with this level of suspicion and regulation of the monastic institution, this presentation asks, who is a good monk for contemporary Thai Buddhists? So I'm of course not interested in answering this question objectively or from my own point of view. Instead, I'm using evidence from Thai Buddhist lady to determine who is a good monk. To answer this question, I will be using some analysis of Thai media from the last decade, looking at both articles and the comments that Thai Buddhists make on these articles. And secondly, a survey I conducted during uh, the last summer months, May through uh, July of 2021, when I um, had 20, uh, sorry, 60 Thai lay Buddhist participants um, answer some questions, and I will draw on this survey for the end of the presentation. So the first source for my presentation today contains some revised ideas and examples from two recent articles that uh, you can uh, see there, and they're both in Southeast Asia journals, um, Southeast Asia Research, and um, a journal called Trans, Trans Regional and National Studies of Southeast Asia. So my findings indicate that although the trust between monks and laity appears to be breaking down, 
confidence remains in the Buddhist teachings and the necessity of support for the religion. But at the same time as Thai Buddhist lady look for good monks and criticize transgressive monks, there's also a paradoxical impulse and tendency for laity to also at the same time not discriminate between monks. So this is captured in the phrase, worship the robes, not the wearer. And in Thai, this is kauro paluan, my chai kon sai paluan. And paluan is like the term for robe. Uh, here, it just means yellow cloth, but um, it's referring to the robes that the monks wear. So this is a well-known phrase among laity in Thailand and throughout Theravada Buddhism. Lay Buddhists say this when Faced with the proliferation of Buddhist scandals to remind themselves to focus on the Buddhist institution and teachings, not individual monks. At the same time as many lay Buddhists say this, many also select and prefer some monks over others. So both of these ideas exist in this tension. When laity have a temple community and regard the monks in their temple as our monks, like they're in a, in a community together and they, they know each other really well, then focusing on the ideals of monastic behavior can be less pronounced. But flexi so flexibility is possible when there are close social bonds. However, from what I'm looking at from the distance of media and posts on social media, this kind of flexibility is not as readily expressed. So I want to develop this point and distinction about social relations between monks and lady further by turning to an important book, Attracting the Heart, Social Relations and the Aesthetics of Emotion in Sri Lankan Monastic Culture by Jeffrey Samuels from 2010. And here Samuels argues that the physical comportment of monks is important, but so are the emotional bonds of attachment and particular aesthetics of familiar temples and monks where lay patrons, senior monks and young novice boys all feel close. The scope of his work is individual temple networks in Sri Lanka. And for my project, I'm looking at what happens when we open the scope wider for Thailand, when we look at us, the society as a whole through newspaper articles, editorials, commentary, and social media posts about monastics physical comportment. From this perspective, there's much more distance and then ooh, much less emotional attachment bred through familiarity. And from this distance, the most important aspect of a monk is their conveyance of a proper monastic aesthetic. People's aesthetic preferences and expectations of monastic purity are determined by time, region, and context. In the case of contemporary Thailand, aesthetic expectations of monastic deportment are in contrast to much of the media regarding monks involved in major and everyday scandals. These scandals point to further evidence for some Thai Buddhists that Buddhism is in decline. So a little bit of history here to get us uh, situated. Uh, monastic performance is necess necessary to indicate and measure the strength of Buddhism. Decline has been a significant issue within the kind of Buddhism that I'm, I'm looking at, Buddhism in mainland Southeast Asia, uh, Theravada Buddhism, with, within the history of Theravada Buddhism. Because the Buddha himself predicted the eventual decline and disappearance of his teachings. When monks are not able to maintain the precepts or demonstrate textual knowledge, this is an indication of decline. Decline has been a major motivating force for Theravada Buddhists, notable especially in periods of intense change, such as colonialism, and there's been some great books written about this. Alicia Turner in her 2014 book, Saving Buddhism, The Impermanence of Religion in Colonial Burma, argues that Burmese Buddhists sought to impede decline and purify monks in the 19th century through efforts such as debates over monastic dress and practice and creation of reform monastic sects. Also in Burma, the Shwagian monastic reform sect founded in 1860. Uh, they understood themselves as the sons of the Buddha through their emphasis on disciplinary purity and intellectual rigor. The reform sect of Siam, the former name of Thailand, that's called the Tamayut, was established in 1830 under the leadership of future King Mongkut. It also emphasized proper monastic ordination rituals and robe wearing along with the study of the Vinayan Pali language. So all of these reforms in both monastic practice and study demonstrate the significant debates and rearticulations of Buddhist performance during periods of perceived decline. 
So today, Thai monks and public intellectuals have found several issues at the heart of structures of monastic life that contribute to the perception that contemporary Buddhism is in decline. So these uh, issues include uh, that that are listed here. They include the lack of authority by uh, senior leadership, uh, commodification of Buddhist symbols and sacred objects, the increasing secularization of Thai society, and increased influence of other religions. These issues are important here, not so much for their veracity as in their semiotic value for articulating nationalistic anxieties within Thai Buddhist monastic and lay Sangha. Since our focus is on the ideas of a good monk, I'm gonna focus on issue number one, the lack of authority of senior monks. Although there are national and regional monastic hierarchies in place led by the Sangharat, who is the Supreme Patriarch and his Sangha Supreme Council, monks and leadership positions are often considered inadequate in managing decline. So here are some uh, critics of uh, senior leadership in Thai, in the Thai Buddhism. Uh, first, a Thai historian, Miti Yaosiwong, believes that structural reform is necessary for the monastic Sangha, which would include more participation and power in the hands of local people and communities. Miti, along with other public intellectuals uh, and monks like the ones pictured here, Sulak Shibarak and Papaisan Wisalo, have also criticized the Sangha Supreme Council's lack of authority over the majority of monks in Thailand, including the training of novice and temporary male monks and monastic education. Because of this, the Sangha authorities have little recourse when the Buddhist public sphere scrutinizes monks for increasing cases of misconduct and inappropriate monastic appearance. These critics argue that the monastic structure in Thailand creates barriers to becoming a good monk. Monks usually learn the monastic life and proper behavior as part of their training as novices or for a short period before their ordination ceremonies. It's up to the individual temples and abbots to make sure each ordained male knows how to follow his training rules. However, with over 33,000 active temples and somewhere between 250,000 to 300,000 monks in the country at, at any given time, monastic rate Regulation is uneven, contributing to the perception that Thai Buddhism is rife with some large scale and everyday scandals. The temple is traditionally considered the place to tame young men, transforming them through the discipline of their lifestyle and practice of renunciation. But this lack of monastic leadership combined with the lack of time dedicated to training in some temples have been some of the factors that these critics have talked about as contributing to widely reported misconduct. These transgressions compounded with broad institutional challenges have generated increased anxiety concerning the strength of Thai Buddhism to serve the needs of the country and individuals. And this has resulted in the male monastic body uh, taking on increased importance. So what is at stake in monks exhibiting less than ideal appearances and behaviors? Lay Thai Buddhists are especially invested in the presentation of monks because of the concept of merit. When lay Buddhists make offerings to monks, they also make or, re or receive merit in, in return. This good deed is believed to negate the effects of past immoral actions in the giver's present life as well as the next. Monks through their discipline lifestyle and dedication to study and practice are considered to be worthy recipients of offerings, making them a proper field of merit for laity. This Buddhist economy of merit binds monks and laity together. Because of their monetary and spiritual investment, lay Thai Buddhists become concerned about the efficacy of merit when Buddhist monks appear to deviate from the ideal monastic body. When monks do not fully enact their renunciation, what happens to the economy of merit? How can Buddhism maintain its influence in Thailand if monks aren't embodying monasticism properly? So these are some of the fundamental concerns about what is at stake in maintaining the proper aesthetic discipline of Thai monks. The evaluation of monastic bodies for lay Buddhists then becomes a visual process of making and remaking what constitutes proper and appropriate forms of the religion. So we're going to take a look back even further in history to the um, more beginning of, of Buddhism to, to think about and underscore the significance of the monastic body and physical deportment of monks. 
So Buddhist monastic bodies have been a visible signification, a sign of the renunciant lifestyle. Marcel Moss described the techniques of the body while Pierre Bourdieu discussed the learned dispositions within cultural environments as the habitus. Buddhist monks in Thailand are embedded within a specific habitus, which affects the techniques of the body they display through their monastic performance. The monastic body is a site of discipline as monks are expected to become subjects of the monastic rules, lifestyle, and hierarchy. The physical comportment of monks is extremely important because it offers a picture of their inner state, the internalization of monastic rules, the level of attainment on the Buddhist path towards enlightenment. Visible signs are inscribed not just on how the body looks, but also how it moves in space. So we'll take a look at a quote from the authoritative manual of meditation and teachings, the Visuddhimagga, which is the path of purification composed by a fifth century scholar monk, Buddha Gosa. And here he offers an ideal description of the comportment of a Buddhist monk. Okay, so this is from the fifth century. So I'll read this quote. A monk is respectful, deferential, possessed of conscience and shame. He wears his inner robe properly, wears his upper robe properly. His manner inspires confidence, whether in moving forwards or backwards, looking ahead or aside, bending or stretching. His eyes are downcast. He has good deportment. This is called proper conduct. Having entered a house, having gone into a street, he goes with downcast eyes. Seeing the length of a plow yoke, so that would be not too far ahead, Restrained, not looking at an elephant, not looking at a horse, not looking at a carriage, a pedestrian, a woman, a man, not looking up or down, not staring this way and that. So even slight bodily movements, as we can see from this quote, are crucial to differentiate the renunciant from the regular lay person. To achieve this ideal monastic performance, texts within the, the Pali Canon, the most authoritative um, group of texts within early Theravada Buddhism, they also describe how to behave. Um, so I will uh, speak for a moment about the Patimoka. The, the Patimoka is the Buddhist monastic code. It outlines some of the unacceptable conduct uh, for monks in one section of Patitya offenses. And these are offenses that should be confessed. Some examples of these 92 rules warn against obvious activities like Monks should not drink alcohol, engage in violent behaviors, or make threatening gestures. Um, but in the same category are also activities like tickling other male monks or unordained persons for fun. Um, another example is water play. Monks should not jump up and down, splash or swim for pleasure, even in water as deep as one, one's ankles. So rules against Behaviors such as these indicate a seriousness of purpose marked on the body's actions, which should lack in frivolity. Partly these rules are in place because a monk's behavior should inspire someone to become interested in the Dhamma. One story from a section of the Pali Vinaya, the Mahavaga, demonstrates this possibility for inspiration. So I'll read this quote too. So then, Venerable Saji, dressing early in the morning, taking his bowl and outer robe, entered Rajagaha for alms. So he enters this, this city for alms. Gracious in the way he approached and departed, looked forward and behind, drew in and stretched out his arm, his eyes downcast, his every movement consummate. Shariputa, the wanderer, saw this venerable, this monk, venerable Asaji, going for alms in Rajagaha. On seeing him, the thought occurred to him, surely of those bhikkhus, monks, in this world were arahants, enlightened beings, or I've entered the path to our hardship, this is one. So from this story, we can see that even these minor movements, like these downcast eyes, are meant to be able to spark another person's faith and curiosity in Buddhism. Although proper, appropriate, and ideal forms of monasticism are illustrated in these selections from the Pali Canon and authoritative commentaries, Regular people receive their ideas of good and bad monastic behavior from a wider range of mediums. Jeffrey Samuels in the book, Attracting the Heart, discusses how concepts such as monastic, Buddhist temple, and pleasing appearance are shaped and determined by and within local communities of monastics and lay Buddhists. These ideas about acceptable monastic behavior are dependent on context, circumstances, experiences, social bonds, and other forms of negotiation between acceptance and expectations. 
Within contemporary Thai Buddhism, monks and laity are in dialogue with recent scandals and contrast the vision of a good monk with the monks caught in major and everyday scandals today. The omnipresence of social media and news outlets exacerbate the number of cases where monks can be portrayed as not following the ideal performance of monasticism, triggering the threat and perception of decline. One important threat of decline from the earliest Buddhist communities to today, in addition to transgressing ideals of general physical comportment that I just discussed, is breaking the boundaries of the gender binary, male and female, masculinity and femininity. So I'll get to that portion now, thinking about gender and sexuality in early Buddhism. The, the Buddha's body itself is an important piece in understanding the construction of the ideal male body, the ideal male masculinity for Buddhist monks. And for John Powers in his 2009 study of Indian Buddhist texts titled A Bull of a Man argues that the Buddha's body is not neutral, asexual, or non-gendered. In fact, through a close reading of Buddhist texts, Powers finds the Buddha's body is portrayed as extremely masculine, which produces attraction from women and men. And this is for two reasons. First, the Buddha's body and beauty were key features in convincing men and women of his moral and spiritual authority. And second, descriptions of the Buddha's body and sexuality create a picture of the Buddha as a real man. Elise Collette, in her review of Powers' book, characterizes male sexuality as aggressive, potent, and proactive, while the female sexuality displayed by female monks is considered as passive and responsive. Although women can reach the highest spiritual achievements, and from this description, female monks' sexuality is not depicted as being as voracious as males, femininity is still described as lower in status and more problematic than masculinity for Buddhism and Buddhist monks. These attitudes towards women are due in part to the belief that rebirth as a female is a consequence of negative karma. Reiko Onuma and her entry on gender for the Encyclopedia of Buddhism summarizes the early Buddhist views of female gender as either uncontrollably lustful or nurturing as wives and mothers. So on these two ends of the spectrum. But what about individuals who are outside of the gender binary? What about biological males that express femininity instead of masculinity? In Pali Buddhist literature, effeminate males are labeled as pandaka. The Buddha forbade most types of pandaka from ordaining after a pandaka monk asked other men to defy him. And the rumor was subsequently spread that all Buddhist monks were pandaka. In Thai, the word for pandaka has become bando. But the more informal and commonly used term for effeminate men is gata. We can see these ideas about sexuality and gender from early Indian Buddhism play out in contemporary Thai Buddhism, where gata monks have become a widespread concern. As Charles Kais notes in his article from 19, back in 1986, uh, titled Ambiguous Gender, Male Initiation in a Northern Thai Buddhist Society, he finds that the ma monastic male subject is created through discipline that allows him to transcend his sexuality. In contrast, Gata monks highlight Buddhist ideas surrounding femininity. If because motherhood is not part of the image or possibility for Gata, they are not seen as people who can nurture Buddhism through their sons, nor are they seen as men who can benefit from the discipline of monasticism. Because they lack the positive qualities of mothers, their femininity is criticized for being negatively attached to worldly activities like dancing, look, wanting to look beautiful, decorating themselves. One way of analyzing how male monastics who express femininity are perceived by Thai Buddhist lady is to consider this idea of the gaze. So the gaze is a helpful theoretical tool to discuss the lay Buddhist view of the monastic body, Laura Mulvey argues in her seminal piece, Visual Pleasure and Narrative Cinema, that the controlling gaze in cinema is male, while the object of the gaze is a passive and or erotic female object, creating a phrase, male gaze. Although uses of the gaze refer mostly to desire, like the male gaze towards a female object, or the tourist gaze, which was first articulated by John Ori in 1990, um, that desires to consume experience outside of everyday life, 
In contrast, within Thai Buddhism, the gaze is directed toward the desire to see proper monastic performance in a thriving Buddhism. The gaze is meant to order and regulate relationships with the other, identifying what is out of the ordinary and what is desirable. Within Thai Buddhism, the active gaze is directed from the lay Buddhists um, to the object of passive male monks, desiring to regulate what seems out of place. Unlike the tourist gaze, which often can find pleasure in the unexpected, the Thai Buddhist lay gaze hopes to find appropriate kinds of difference between the secular lifestyle and the monastic one, and between feminine and masculine behaviors. This gaze is distant but not detached. The lady who take part in this surveillance by posting and sharing transgressions witnessed on social media are heavily invested in Thai Buddhism and concerned about its fate. Their gaze is not neutral, but is informed by the lay Buddhist place within Buddhism. Okay, another element I'd like to discuss here is the regime of images within Thailand. While the Buddhist lay gaze has been an important check on monasticism throughout its history, Thai society has also had an important relationship with visual appearances. Within Thai society, the gaze has been discussed as part of what scholar of Thai culture, Peter Jackson calls the regime of images from his 2004 article. This regime locates power in monitoring and policing the surface, images, behaviors, and representations in public. The Thai regime of images is interested in the context of time and place, which is the, the word in Thai, Kalapesa. One should know the proper ways to perform one's social roles, depending on who one is talking with and where one is. Following and understanding Galatesa, as well as recognizing the regime of images, is important throughout Thai society and takes on heightened levels of significance in the temple and in monastic roles. This regime of images can be seen through social media. And social media also enhances the possibility for surveillance and policing within this regime of images. While monks may feel comfortable around familiar laity, such as family members or longtime donors or temple volunteers, the ability of anyone to observe and criticize monastic bodily presentation increases anxiety for monks. Michael Sladek in his article, Imagine Laity and the Performance of Monasticism in Northern Thailand has investigated the ways novice monastics in one Northern Thai temple imagine the laity's expectations. Monastics project ideas onto this imagined laity, considering what they might think or how they would react to certain behaviors. However, not all monks are able to imagine the laity or demonstrate the pleasing comportment for the Thai Buddhist lay gaze. Examples of everyday scandals and the gaze upon effeminate male monks demonstrate the small ways that inappropriate monastic behavior can add up to a feeling that Thai Buddhism is on the decline. So I'll give some examples examples now, some contemporary examples from the media of everyday scandals and then uh, effeminate monks. So what are the appropriate locations for monastics in contemporary Thailand? Which actions are acceptable? How should monks comport themselves within the temple and public spaces? Buddhist monks are expected to spend most of their time in the temple environment. There, they function as conduits of merit making for Thai lay Buddhists. Ho their hosts of celebrations for Buddhist holidays, the ritual specialists for Buddhist funerals. Outside of the temple space, monks can also act as fields of merit. They're often invited to houses or shops for opening ceremonies and blessings. These are all part of the duties of a monk, where lay people expect to see them conducting rituals and being available as sources of merit. However, male monastics have increasingly been appearing in unexpected places, unrelated to the temple or ritual environment. When Thai lay Buddhists view photos of monks in inappropriate locations, conducting questionable actions on Thai media websites, they begin to wonder about the state of the monastic institution, as we'll see from comments on social media. So how do these photos spread through Thai media and social media platforms? Everyday scandals are often reported by ordinary Thai citizens using social media. These Thai citizens who are involved in the posting and commenting on photos are known as netizens, Chao net in Thai. A significant number of articles about everyday monastic scandals are based on pictures and videos Thai Buddhist netizens have taken of monks in public, which usually emerges when a Thai Buddhist layperson surreptitiously takes a picture of a monk spotted outside of the temple or ritual environment. Um, so I participated in this uh, 
surreptitiously taking a picture of these monks when I was in Starbucks one day and they were shopping for Starbucks merchandise. So it, I, I saw it was very easy to participate in this because it just happened while I was just doing work in Starbucks. And it would be very unusual to see monks in Starbucks because Starbucks in Thailand is considered to be a very high uh, class type of coffee shop. And monks wouldn't necessarily, you wouldn't expect to see monks there. So articles in Thai media can also be based on selfies, also taken by monks. And then those monks post them online and then they've been shared further by Thai netizens for the purpose of critique and shock. The debates surrounding such pictures reveal opinions regarding acceptable and unacceptable actions for monks. The examples below signal the breakdown and distinction between monks and laity and the perceived decline of Buddhism in Thailand. So the first example reveals that an important part of the difference between lay and ordained Buddhists is that monastics are expected to live in a temple and live simply rather than take part in luxury activities that seem more suitable for householders than monks. This example comes from an article in Ameren News, a Thai media outlet from 2017 which revealed selfies posted by a monk during a trip to the mall with the title, social media shows the monk who pays for others, eats luxuriously and looks classy. In this article, the monk is nicknamed Long Pi Honey Toast, uh, or the monk who eats honey toast, referring to the photo of him eating the snack food uh, item at the dessert chain uh, after you, which is in the mall. And um, it, it indicates that a monk, you know, if he's eating this kind of snack food and it's very like expensive snack food and it's not, it's part of his meal. It's usually a monk would eat breakfast and lunch and that would be it. You're not, you don't need any kind of snacks after that. So because of that, this monk appears to be high society or in Thai, it's um, shortened to high so is a word in Thai. And it's a phrase that means rich or enjoying life in a way which is perceived to be opposite to the monastic life. In the comment section, Thai netizens criticized the monk for his inappropriate actions. One commenter believes it's not the monk's fault because lay Buddhists give money directly to individual monks when they make merit. So the commenter continues that because of this monetary exchange, monks now ordain so they can make a good income. Thai lay Buddhists are seen as partly culpable by offering money, which has the potential to corrupt and distract monks from their aesthetic lifestyles. So these comments, in these comments, the sentiments reveal a fear and sensitivity to Buddhism being in decline because of monks being tempted to lead these more luxurious lives. Another Thai Buddhist sees a monk racing through his neighborhood on a motorcycle and posts a video and photos on Facebook. He asks his friends on social media to help him research which temple this monk lives in and why he's speeding on a motorcycle so quickly. The story was picked up by Teeny News with the title, Villagers Confused, Monk Zooms His Motorcycle on the Road, while social media criticizes. The original poster continues to explain that it seems inappropriate to use a motorcycle. One commenter writes that, in 2018, nowadays, monks can do everything if they want. They don't need to wait on someone else. Other netizens state that this monk is obstructing the religion and that they do not have the controlled manner of a monk. These comments reveal that Thai Buddhist lady expect a monk to subject himself to the humble lifestyle required to be a legitimate field of merit. So that would be that would mean walking instead of using the convenience of a motorcycle. And alms round when the monk goes around to collect food from the lay people in the morning is another issue where lay Thai Buddhists are concerned about the monastic body's presence and actions. In an article by M. Thai News, a picture showing a monk sitting next to offering baskets, the sangatan here in the yellow foil, it contains food and other items. Um, an article is called Appropriate or Not, social media clip shows monks sitting and receiving alms from lay people. The original post by a Thai Buddhist netizen contained the comment, new era offering alms, the monk just sitting and waiting, the shop providing service. The implication here is that now monks are not practicing in the traditional ways by walking and receiving alms from the lady they pass. Instead, the practice has become modern and convenient, with monks sitting and waiting while lay people can buy food from nearby sellers. These netizens became upset at what they perceive as the lazy or modern behavior of monks. The commenters reveal that they would rather see monks exerting effort and discipline required of the monastic rules in order to fulfill their duty as a field of merit. So from these examples, we can see that everyday scandals occur 
when monastic bodily actions are considered inappropriate in public spaces or in temples. Monks, as we can learn from the netizen comments, do not belong in malls on motorcycles or eating dinner and drinking in the temple as seen in the picture here. Monks should not be using social media to take selfies while taking part in luxury activities. Male monastic bodies are also chastised when they're not exhibiting the discipline and traditional values associated with monasticism. Although these are everyday activities, the point is that they are too ordinary. They're too ordinary to fit with the monastic life. They signal the decline of Thai Buddhism because they threaten to further pull apart the mutual dependence that binds monks and laity together in tension through their very different lifestyles. Besides acting like lay people, male monks' monastic performance is also critiqued when exhibiting femininity. This type of bodily transgression has captured the focus of the Thai Buddhist lay gaze and significant media attention in Thailand. So I'll offer three examples of good Thai monks in the media and the ways Thai Buddhist lady reacted to their perceived transgressions. So the first one, in, the, in this first one, you can see that two Buddhist monks have entered the shoe section inside a department store in Bangkok. One of them is trying on high-heeled lady, lady shoes. Another customer in the store, a Thai lay Buddhist, snaps a picture of this behavior and posts it to her social media account. Soon larger Thai media websites start to take notice, like Kapook Highlight News. Kapook's article on this declares that the monks are trying on shoes because every temple is a runway. It is, of course, deemed inappropriate by the Thai Buddhist public for monks to have a materialistic lifestyle. However, there is an additional reason this picture has gone viral. The issue of femininity and sexuality is apparent, with commenters declaring that openly gay monks are appearing more and more in public spaces. The original poster of this photo on Facebook writes that these monks just cut their hair and entered the temple. It has not been long since they became close. I think there's definitely a secret here. So she kind of assumes that because they're trying on uh, female high-heeled lady shoes that they are a couple together. Uh, she puts those things uh, together herself. So another commenter refers to the monks with the female particle in Thai, Luang J, instead of a common way of calling it a young male monk, which is Luang Pi. And then this commenter asks, did you buy this high heeled shoe for yourself? Finally, the most critical comment states that this commenter wanted to ordain his whole life, but only did so for three months because he saw so many similar problems with the monks in his temple. He then asks, why do foreign men who are rich ordain to let go of everything, but monks in our country ordain in order to collect more things? Comments such as this decry the lack of monks who can follow the rules of asceticism, and it is assumed that femininity makes the ascetic lifestyle more difficult. The Thai Buddhist lay gaze indicates that the ideal monastic body, one that would signify a thriving Thai Buddhism with effective merit making, would be lacking in feminine presentation. So articles about the Thai monk often contain some explanatory text, but the main feature is the pictures of the monks and showing their femininity, like here, some uh, wearing makeup, face masks, posing in a feminine postures, with hands on lap or curled on their faces, monks embracing one another, as well as posing with the robes fitted tightly to the chest. The website post today profiled this issue in July 2013, displaying these pictures of a feminine presenting men in the article titled Padut on a Rampage, making love, showing off their beauty for lay people. Dut is a more is a derogatory term in English that could be translated as sissy. Uh, more definitely derogatory, not like the toy. So the Post Today news team, <coughs> which assembled these photographs, write that every day the phenomenon of these types of monks is increasing. The authors go on to describe the beauty details of the pictures of effeminate monks, noting their eyeliner, glossy lips, arched eyebrows, blue contact lenses. These kinds of behaviors are deemed disrespectful by the time of this lay gaze, displaying an interest in showing off and lustfulness. And the last example here is from Teeny News, which covered uh, one scandal that arose when a Facebook page posted pictures of a monk which fashioned his robe to look like a tight tube top dress. The picture shows a monk with face blurred or with a smiley face emoji covering it, lying in a boat with full view of their legs and walking with their robe only covering the upper thigh. The text of the article describes how the monk modified the robe into a strapless dress, pulled tight on their flesh and stepped onto the boat. 
When a police officer found this monk's temple, the abbot explained that the monk had been living there for four years and there'd never been a problem before. But when the abbot explained to this offending monk that his behavior was inappropriate, the monk understood and realized what he had done and asked to disrobe immediately. The 15 commenters on this article were glad that this monk had disrobed, calling him wicked, one who was destroying the religion and addicted to defilements, especially the, de the defilement of fashion. These comments reveal that feminine ways of showing off one's body assume that one is attached to worldly things like fashion and thus are upsetting to the Thai Buddhist lay gaze. So after seeing all of these media pieces about these monastic transgressions, I wanted to find out what are the qualities of a, of a good monk then for more regular Thai people. Um, so I asked uh, 60 participants some uh, people that I know, contacts that I have, who then asked for their friends uh, to participate in this uh, survey, um, this Google form online. And I translated all the responses with uh, the help of a research assistants. Uh, so I had one research assistant translate or, and do the interviews herself, 10 of them, and the other 50 I uh, translated with uh, some you know, help from a research assistant as a non-native speaker to give me some insight into some of the different kinds of phrasing or idioms that I might not know as well. So here are the questions that I asked in the survey. And the data that I'm analyzing here comes from these uh, three questions that I've starred. Which monks do you have faith in? Why? Which monks are worthy of respect? Are there any monks or kinds of monks you consider not worthy of respect. And so this is, you know, preliminary and I only had 60 people, they're not totally representative, but I think that there was still a lot of very interesting information that came out of this. Um, in terms of the ages, there's a, a variety of ages, uh, but more people were middle-aged and I had more female participants. And there were also a variety of occupations with the most being in education. So what I found was that for Thai words emerged as the most frequent and most important characteristics and values to praise in a good monk. And I'll discuss all four of these. Uh, Samruam, uh, Sando, Samata, and the phrase Bati 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 Bachap. So the most important idea for monks to evoke is Samruam, which highlights restraint and composure. In Buddhist texts, it's often translated as restraint, uh, but in Thai, it's more often translated as composure. A monk with samruam exhibits control in body, speech, and mind. Many of my survey participants use some combination of the phrase samruam nagiriya lewaja, which means like the composure restraint in actions and speech. A monk with this quality follows the appropriate etiquette in their manners and behaviors they're neat and tidy, peaceful, quiet, and calm. A person who does not exhibit some ruang would be described as distracted, you know, maybe like looking here and there, like back from the from the Buddhist text of, of the, the monk on Amzran would not be looking here and there, right? So it, it kind of um, connects to that. Um, a person who's not exhibiting some some ruang also would like to be gossiping about worldly affairs, would show that they had not cut their defilements of greed, anger, and delusion, and would be stuck in selfishness. As one survey participant, a middle-aged man named Ju, stated about a monk who is not worthy of respect, there are some monks that you can judge by appearance. They're not peaceful because they act impolite, restless, fussy. They speak like a layman and not a monk. They're not clean and do not wear their robes correctly. These qualities Ju listed show a lack of composure and control of monastic behavior and presentation. Samata is, a, is maybe known to some of the uh, listeners here as a Pali term for the type of meditation that focuses on one object of concentration. But it's also a Thai word which also expresses a Thai Buddhist value expected of monks, meaning unambitious, plain, contented, simple, wanting or needing little. As renunciants, monks are expected to develop themselves so they can be satisfied without wanting or having to be anything else. This contentment with the simple life creates tranquility and serene mental states. The quality is expect, exhibited when monks regulate their emotions, maintaining equanimity. A monk exhibiting samatha will not ask for donations and you will not find them at a coffee shop or a mall. 
some of the examples my survey participants gave of a monk exhibiting samatha is a monk who is not, not addicted to devices, not receiving money in their alms bowl, not appearing in uh, busy or in a rush. And the third one is sando. And this connotes qualities of solitariness, being isolated and alone without needing anyone or anything. Sando is a word often seen in quotes by monks expressing inspirational ideas about the Dhamma. Well-respected scholar monk Prabhayuta is quoted as saying, Sando is feeling easily happy by a small thing and being happy with things you already have. Whatever you have, it creates happiness. Although a monk exhibiting qualities of Sando interacts with other monks, and laity, he does not depend on this social interaction, nor is he interested in being known in social circles. A monk with sando would not be answering a phone and would not show signs of a wandering mind. B, a female participant in her 30s, wrote in response to monks not worthy of respect, they do not immerse themselves in things, the daily life of people, going on trips, things normal people do. They are not interested in luck, praise, or gaining status. In this way, Sandot embodies a kind of freedom that is not dependent on external conditions. And lastly is the phrase Bhati 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 And this means one who practices well, directly, and correctly following the Buddhist teachings. Bhati Bhati refers to practice, performance, any kind of behavior. And it's most commonly uh, used in the phrase for, for Buddhism, Bhati Bhati which means to practice following the Buddhist teachings, the Dhamma. Well-known scholar and activist monk Prabhaisan Wisalo describes the phrase as meaning practicing following the teachings of the Buddha, especially the Eightfold Path, and behaving according to the discipline. In other words, living in the discipline, progressing in practice, not going backwards. A monk who is identified as practicing well might do some extra renunciatory practices like walking on pilgrimage, relying on whatever is given to them, or practicing meditation intensively for a long period of time. These kinds of exertions are highly valued by the laity. So all these words illustrate the expectations of good monks for laity, controlled, satisfied, emotionally regulated, content with life and practicing well. At the same time as laity evaluate monks based on these values, there is that impulse to respect all monks, as mentioned earlier, respect the robe, not the wearer. One survey participant commented this way, and that's the one of the quotes that's here on the left. We still need to pay some respect to all monks. In general, many times pay respect to a person who wears the monastic robes. But if I have witnessed his behavior often, the respect that I have will reduce as he is not worthy of respect. And so similarly, Ake, a retired Thai lay Buddhist in his 60s offered this sentiment. If there is a good practice temple which observes precepts, I would go to make merit there. If the temple does not observe precepts, making merit there would be wrong. So I don't go to a bad temple where monks practice badly. I have to know the temple first in monks before I can decide. Not all Thailand Buddhists, of course, have the same evaluation standards, but for many of these four characteristics are important to observe when they want to make merit with a good monk. These four qualities are important for Thailand Buddhists today at this moment of perceived decline, when monks less worthy of support are discussed more frequently than good monks in Thai media. So in conclusion, what can we learn about contemporary Buddhism when we focus on a monastic body? First, we can observe that it's difficult but necessary to be perceived as a good monk. Even small bodily transgressions can compound to indicate to Thai Buddhist lady that their religion is in decline. The threat of the abnormal monastic body signals that Thai Buddhism is losing its strength in society. The Thai lay Buddhist assumption appears to be that a majority of masculine presenting monastics would signal the health and thriving nature of Buddhism in Thailand as indicated by comments that Gatali monks are causing the degeneration of the religion. The stakes of the appearance and actions of the male monastic body are quickly raised as media continue to report on everyday scandals with the Thai Buddhist lay gaze focused on both this lack of difference from laity and femininity while in the robes. The effect of so many articles over time causes netizens to comment that there are few good monks left who live the renunciant life purely and ordain to study and meditate, working toward liberation. When Thai Buddhist lady evaluate monks from the distance of social media and social media posts, physical appearance takes on increased importance. Close analysis of monastic deportment inside and outside of the temple will continue to be an important site for understanding Thai Buddhist perceptions of the health of their religion. 
And that's all I have. Thank you very much. I look forward to any questions that people have. Okay, thank you very much for that uh, erudite and detailed talk. Um, there are a couple of questions that have already come in. Um, so I'll begin with those questions. If anyone else has questions, please type them into the, uh, the Q&A form now. Um, and I have a few questions of my own that I'll get to if, uh, if the questions don't flow in at the rate that I am expecting. So uh, the first question is from Haley who uh, begins by saying, your presentation is so interesting. Uh, my question is, what are the consequences of a, disrupt of a disruption in the field of merit for lay people? Is their merit understood to be less potent when monks misbehave or conduct themselves in an inappropriate way? Yes, and if this, this is the Haley, I think it is. Hi, and thank you for your uh, question. Um, so that that's a, that is such a good question, and that's what I really am still trying to figure out what, a, you know, of course it's gonna be different for different people, you know, what they think and what they say. Like if people are saying things like, respect the robes, not the wearer, then, you know, no matter what your intention is to support the monastic life and to support Buddhism and the temple, then you're gonna make merit for that. Um, but some people like uh, towards the end of the talk were saying how it would be wrong to support a monk that you knew was bad and that was not following the monastic life. So I, so I think that these, there are different ideas that people would have. There wouldn't be one way of thinking of it. And that also these ideas exist in tension so that and it would have to do with, it would have to do with the intention of the giver and the amount of knowledge that someone had about the, the temple. Um, but that's something that I hope to research more on and get some more ideas and opinions on when I am able to go back to Thailand soon in, in late May. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, so the next question is uh, from one of our uh, instructors here at Carleton named uh, Melanie Coughlin. So she says, uh, thank you for sharing this awesome research with us. I was wondering how you might conceptualize the connection between policing monks' bodies and broader social expectations. That is, along with the failure to use the body to generate merit, which you've obviously just spoken to, how do these criticisms work to enforce heteronormativity in society more generally? Yeah, that's a really good question as well. Um, to think about you know, that, that kind of overlap between Thai society in general, uh, ideas of, of gender, and um, gender boundaries, gender crossing is, it's interesting to think about because scholars of gender studies in Thailand have noted and you know, lots of um, people like to kind of praise Thailand as being like really open to different kinds of gender because of the openness of, of, of men who can present in the feminine ways and also women who can present themselves in masculine ways. Um, and it seems like very open. But if you kind of look closer at the society in general, then there are some, you know, structurally, it's not really set up to be so open. If we think about the Thai regime of images that I just talked about, in that idea, it's about, it's about the surface, it's about the images. So if you see that someone is presenting in a feminine way, and then you can kind of act uh, around them as if they're like, you know, similar to a woman or a feminine person, and and it's fine if you're friends with them, and if they're, you know, this is how this is how they are. But if you think about um, something like deeper about, you know, their their personal life that they want to get into, or they want to advocate for change, like structural reform or gender um, marriage equality or um, things like this, then that's when it gets to be much more problematic. But just at the surface, having, having this kind of level of gender non-normativity is in, like in general seems to be tolerated, but um, like going deeper into family structures or political structures, it's much more difficult. And then when you think about monastics and the monastic life, that is much more highly regulated than just than, than the, the kind of general society, general population uh, there 
as I described, they expect and want the monks to be uh, fully masculine, 100% male, as they uh, often describe monks or describe uh, a men who are, that, and that, that means men who are straight um, and men who appear masculine. Um, that, that is much more important for monks and it's somewhat acceptable for men or women to act in, in different, um, you know, the, the different gender in, in regular society. And in fact, when monks act as, or appear the show, uh, their, their femininity in the robes, people will sometimes comment like the, on, on social media and stuff that they should just roll if they want to do that. And they can be a gatui in regular society. Um, but the expectation for monks is much more strict in that way. So that's what I'd say, but that's a big, big topic. So thank you. Yeah, now actually building on that and connecting back to your talk in 2020, I seem to recall that you showed some images of like really buff, hunky yeah. monks. Yeah. And you commented that lay people responded very differently to the sort of idealized male body, like the ideal sort of masculine male body when monks were embodying it. So I wonder if you could maybe just tie that in a little bit to. Yeah, yeah thank you. Yeah, I, I couldn't include that in the, in the uh, talk, but it, it's uh, always interesting to see the, the hunky monks, the monks with the big muscles. Um, so there are, there are a few that have come over into different uh, articles in, in Time Media over uh, the few years. Um, the one, one in particular was a, like um, a temper, it's just a temporary monk, but he was this kind of bodybuilder and he took selfies of himself and then everybody loved it. And they, I mean, you know, he's got this huge muscle. It doesn't even look like a person, but it's like a huge muscle. And everybody, like there was no problem with that. Um, it was that it, people were kind of excited about this and they were using it as, a, as part of the campaign to request lay people to give better nutritious food to the monastics. And so it was as if, if you give them better food, they're all gonna sudden, somehow become so muscular. Um, but that's how, that's how they were kind of taking it. Um, but monks, but, but, but it was, you know, him, his, his body was like already that way. But when, uh, contrasted that with monks who were seen to be exercising, uh, too much, too concerned with, uh, going to the, you know, going to a public gym, things like this was not considered to be good. So it really all does depend on that, on that context, on that uh, time and place, on that, that Galatesa that I mentioned in that, you know, uh, how people are interpreting. Um, each and and how it comes out in, in the media and people all have all these kinds of different opinions but that was in, in general uh, the idea of the the ideal male ma masculinity was praised and I mean I, I think that that's echoed even in the title of Strong's book right like the Buddha as a bull of a man and that being yeah. seen as a as a laudable thing that he had this supremely masculine body and that body was tied into you know, karmic understandings of, you know, you have the body you have because of your karmic allotment yeah. from previous lives, etc. Yeah. Um, yeah, so a quick comment from, uh, from Daly, who is wondering how the bodybuilder monk was able to show off his body in a way that um, seemingly the monk in the boat was also doing the same thing. Yeah. But like why? Why do you think though they responded so differently to essentially the same action? Yeah, good, great um, question there. For the bodybuilder monk, he was wearing the robes properly. He had his robes on, you know, fully and correctly, and um, he was just taking a selfie of himself, so included like his face and and his, um, you know, up to his uh, his chest. And so it just kind of showed his muscles coming out of the robes. So he hadn't modified his robe in any way. And that's actually one of the Sakia offenses is to 
adjust your robe in the, in, in the monastic code, like one of the more minor offenses, is to adjust your robe or, and to make it appear in a way that's the style of a lay person. So that's like an official problem with the, with the monk who made his robe like into a tube top dress. Like it was because that he had arranged it in such a way to look like a lay person. But of course, like most Thai Buddhist lay people aren't going there uh, to the monastic code. Um, they're just looking at it and saying, this, this person, it appears like they're looking very feminine and that they're not a they're not a full man they're not a 100% man and it looks like they're trying it looks like they're trying to show off a feminine appearance but for the bodybuilder monk it didn't look it wasn't you couldn't be sure that he was trying to show off it was just his body and he was just wearing the robes and he was just taking a picture of himself he wasn't in just as a regular it wasn't posing in any way it was just like here i am um, so I think those factors led to that discrepancy in, um, in the reactions. So your notion of the, uh, the lay Buddhist gaze, I think is a fascinating and important one because it speaks to a persistent tension inside of Buddhism as an institutional religion. And I thought it was really important that you began with Vinaya because for anyone who's present who hasn't read Vinaya, these law texts, they aren't just lists of rules. Instead, they're full of stories. And those stories are very often about lay people being offended by the conduct of monks. So when explaining why Buddhist rules exist, it's not because, you know, wearing your robe in a certain way might impede your ability to practice as a monk. Instead, the stories are always, you know, so-and-so monk was playing in the water, a lay person saw it, complained to the king, and then the king was upset and so contacted the Buddha and the Buddha had to make a rule. Um, so I guess my question based on that is, um, when you present this research, um, do you ever get responses from attendees who assume that this is some sort of uh, aberration from the proper practice of Buddhism, that this is, it's atypical of Buddhism? And how do you get around those concerns as your, as an educator, I guess? Yeah, I know it is, it is tricky as an educator, like especially if I'm thinking about you know students and um, and teaching, because I I don't want to present Buddhism or the monastic life as as something that's you know really going downhill, um, and that's why I try to show that you know there are these you know minor things that people people are um, you know situated within their Buddhist communities, their Buddhist lifestyles, and it's building on the, you know, the history of Buddhism, like you just uh, so nicely uh, put it, Chris. And so when, so like when, te when teaching, I don't mind, you know, doing that and, and showing these uh, and, you know, reading these kinds of things and um, showing these kinds of images, because I know that my students are with firmly within the context of Buddhism and they understand the whole the whole system and how this you know kind of works together um and so that's why i do think it's really important to present that you know that historical um information the information from the from the vinia the history of the buddhist rules and how this is really i mean it's really a continuation of that and you know it's it's the social media that makes it appear like it's, uh, you know, snowballing uh, <laughs> rapidly. Um, but when I talk about this research with monks, with student monks, that's one of the things that they uh, comment to me, that this is, this is something that probably has happened, you know, many, for many, many generations, but we didn't have this kind of distance of social media. And we didn't have this proliferation of people that were able to just, you know, not 
know who these people are and just and just snap pictures and, and post it and not really know what's going on, not know the context at all. Um, and so at the Buddhist time, it, it, you know, it seems like that's that's kind of what happened, you know, when lay people just kind of see the monks and they didn't know them. Um, but that was, you know, kind of isolated instances. But this is, you know, just so, so many over time. So that's why I try to show that it's, you know, the, the kind of factors involved are that this is the distance, that, that this isn't like a, the context of like a village where you know everybody and you know everything. And this is um, social media where people feel like it's, you know, it's easy, it's anonymous. You, you, you can just post and you can just make comments and they can be somewhat insensitive. Um, but but they are a lot of them are 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 passionate you know some of them are silly silly comments and things like this I've read but you know a lot of them are passionate about uh, Thai Buddhism and, and wanting it to be um, a, you know wanting it wanting to support good temples and good monks and feeling frustrated about that. So on on that front and by the way I I have a bunch more questions but if anyone out there also has questions feel free to uh, to type them into the q and a um something that i i do wonder though is the extent to which um discourses of buddhist modernism might be informing the thai lay response because i know that um you know buddhist modernism in its sort of early guise as it was initially talked about was the the way that buddhism was sort of repackaged to the west but that repackaging happened in in southeast asia you know it, like the vipassana movement began there and that idea that good monks are monks that meditate all the time and that meditation is the key feature of buddhist life like that was that's very much a sort of 20th century repackaging of buddhism and so I wonder whether your, uh, yeah, whether your lay respondents were engaging with that kind of Buddhist modernist discourse in trying to evaluate monks, or is this something that's more situated in traditional Thai ideals about Buddhism? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's difficult to say. Um, yeah, and that's something I will, you know, attempt to try to get at further in uh, in future research. But I would say and, and guess for now that it's it seems to me like more traditional values like but then you know buddhist modernism also kind of goes back to the original you know buddha and and uh and traditional ideas as well like you know the wandering like the one horn of the rhinoceros and so it's like it's like that's that's there too within the lay ideal of the monk that is striving for nirvana that is mm. you know isolated and that mm, does this kind of meditation i mean that's like yeah the the ideal monk who doesn't who doesn't take any money and that's what the a lot of the survey participants were talking about how they were upset that monks today they thought they you know from what they had seen that they were ordaining to gain an income and so if you don't you know, if monks aren't handling handling money themselves, then you don't have to worry about that. And most of the participants, one of one of my questions was about temples and like which temple would you go to if you had a choice? Like some people just go to the temple that they live nearby. But if you like could go to any temple, which temple would you go to? And like almost everybody said like the forest temples, mm -hmm. which are the still like you know they are practicing in more of the, I think it's commonly accepted, more of the ideal monastic practice than the city temples where monks are, you know, given, you know, money in, in you know, directly. Um, but in the forest temples, the monks aren't, aren't given any money and they're very far away from any kind of commerce or, you know, mall, like you can't see them in Starbucks. So um, there's, there's no problem with those, with those kinds of monks. So it's it's issues that have to do with the monks that are that are in the city, and that's the majority of the monks, and those are the, the monks who are trying to get an education, 
um, you know, it's part of the social welfare system of, of Thailand to help out the uh, disadvantaged young men who don't have too many other options. Um, and then, you know, so then it seems like there could also be a class issue involved mm -hmm. too, um, because these are the monks that are getting shown on social media for the most part. And, and these are the ones who kind of need monasticism to move up in the world after um, they disrobe, but they are expected to be good. And many of them are, you know, of course, but they are expected to be good good monks while they're in the robes. Um, even if their intention is to just ordain temporarily to get an education and then disrobe after that, it's still meant to be like, this is, you know, the, the taming of the masculinity and making it proper and useful for society and for family life and, and as, a, as a householder going forward. So yes, many ideas I came up with there, but I think that you, <laughs> I think, yeah, I think it, it connects a lot with uh, traditional ideals. So um, that notion that you just mentioned is actually one that I hadn't heard about before. So in Thai society, one of the ideas that governs um, males joining the, the monastic life temporarily is the idea of taming masculinity. So it, yeah. Yeah, I mean, especially for men, young men who are going to be married, hmm. the, a common idea that you, you should be like some like more, maybe more, you know, progressive or, or you know, kind of bro more broad minded thinking uh, uh, families wouldn't necessarily care, but uh, many families would like for their a son-in-law to have ordained at some point because that shows that they have some kind of discipline, they have some knowledge of Buddhism and they have some basis of morality that they're going to be bringing to the family and the future, you know, the, the, the future family that they're going to build and, and come into. So it makes, yeah, it makes the, the man, um, like a yeah, this kind of more yeah, more of a more of a tame you know because the the idea of the young man is kind of you know a little bit rough and has uh, some aggression and has a lot of untamed sexuality, um, but the monastic life is you know meant to really make that uh, more smooth, tame tame those kinds of impulses. Hmm. So. Um... Does anyone else out there have any more questions for Dr. Shednick? I see that we're actually getting close to the, uh, the end of our time together. Um, while, while we're waiting to see if anyone else adds an additional question, I just have, a, a, I guess, a slightly silly question. Um, you had a slide that uh, I think the caption was something about monastic comportment, and it featured a bunch of monks bowing to the front yeah. And there were two large statues of like a, a cute little monk with glasses and they were sort of plasticky looking. And I was just wondering if uh, you knew what those uh, adorable monk statues signified. They're always around. Those <laughs> really? Kinds of ones. And they're holding like an alms bowl and it's like a, it has a slot in it. So it's like a donation box. Ah, okay. Yeah, I took that photo and I think it's it's funny because also you can see that one of the monks is like looking back at the camera. So I think it's kind of funny to show. <laughs> but yeah, it's a it's a pretty one. I like that photo. Mm -hmm. um, okay, well, we have not received any additional comments. So I think on that, it's uh, perhaps a good time for us to adjourn. So I would just like to conclude by once again, thanking you, Dr. Brooke Shednick, for coming to Carleton, albeit virtually, and uh, delivering one of this year's Davidson lectures. It was, a, it was a real pleasure to listen to you this evening. Thank you. It's been great to visit virtually to Carleton. <laughs> okay.